Now, isn't God good? All the time, God is truly good. If you'd be so kind to bow with me just for a moment. Eternal Father God, it's in the, your precious name that we pray today. Speak into our hearts a word from the Lord that we may grow and become the people of God you desire us to be. Let us not just be hearers of your word, but become doers. For this now we pray in the strong and mighty name of your Son, Jesus the Christ. Amen. As you remain standing, turn with me to Titus chapter 2. The book of Titus, the last of the T's, 1st and 2nd Timothy, uh, Thessalonians, then Timothy, then Titus. Titus chapter 2. And I'll be reading from verses 11 through 15, and you'll find these words there in Titus chapter 2, starting at verse 11. For the grace of God that brings salvation has appeared to all men, teaching us that denying ungodliness and worldly lusts, we should live soberly, righteously, and godly in the present age looking for the blessed hope and the glorious appearing of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ. And each time I read that this week, I just about went crazy. Amen. Looking forward, or looking for the blessed hope and the glorious appearing of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ who gave himself for us that we might be redeemed us from every lawless deed and purify for himself his own special people, zealous for good works. Speak these things, one translation says certain things, exhort and rebuke with all authority. Let no one despise you. The school of God's grace. You may be seated. The school of God's grace. Did you know that most colleges offer a continuing education program? These classes they offer can be valuable resources for those who wish to go on learning and enriching their lives. Lots of people take advantage of these opportunities, however many do not. Maybe they don't know about the possibility or maybe they just hate school so much that they wouldn't touch the idea of going back to school with a 10-foot pole. But I have news for all Christians in this church today. You are required to attend school again. It's time to go back to school. Yes, you must attend God's school of grace. In fact, you're already enrolled. You have been on the rolls ever since the day you became a Christian. Let me ask you, have you been studying? Would you like to see your report card? Well, sorry, it's already in the hands of your father in heaven. How did you come to be enrolled in God's school of grace? It's the first step we take coming to know the Lord as our Savior. You see, Jesus paid the price for our tuition by dying on the cross and shedding his blood for your sin and my sin. The Apostle Paul is one of the writers of the school catalog. In it, he describes what the curriculum includes, what the incentive plan is for being a good student, and what provisions God has made enable each student to be able to progress towards an A+. This is what Paul meant when he wrote, for the grace of God that bringeth salvation hath appeared to all men. It teaches us to say no. The university of God's grace does not just give us the theory and enables us to grasp lessons. It also disciplines us in order to transform our lives. Teaching, as used in this text, means instructing, educating, admonishing, disciplining, molding, and forming character. Yes. It means to school and to train. God's grace uh, does, involve, does involve anything that we can earn, but it does include much that we can learn. Yes. To us is to say, do this and don't do that. 
God's grace encourages us to do what we should, and it reprimands us when we fell short to do what we ought to do. God is not happy with mediocre students. In this school of grace, Christians are taught that living for Christ is serious business. The lessons learned in this school will continue, amen, will contribute to the joy and the usefulness in this life. God's grace essentially teaches us several very important lessons. First, we should be what? Denying certain things. Denying certain things. According to Titus 12, 2a, there are two things that we ought to lay aside, and they are, amen, and they're the embodiment of all of what is sin. And the first one is ungodliness. Ungodliness. Ungodliness is whatever is without or against God. Anything that crowds God out of our life and belittles his claim upon us falls in the category of ungodly. The ungodly life is one in which God does not live. God's grace has appeared to school us in avoiding the error of living without God in our thoughts, our words, and our deeds. It teaches us to deny and to lay aside all manner of life wherein God is not consulted. When a person is saved, rescued, or schooled by God's glorious grace, they will remain, amen, retain God in their thinking. God's presence will be their joy. God's strength will be their confidence. God's glory will be the chief end of their being. Then we are to lay aside, what? Worldly lust. Worldly lust includes selfishness, pride, sensuality, and desires of longing that attracts themselves to the fleeing things of which of this earth entice us with all the time. Worldly lust are those things that attract and pull us in the, in the direction that God doesn't want us to go. In the school of grace, we learn to say no to the things that drag us down, that tie us up, wraps us up in chains, in a world that's in a rebellion against God. If we never learn anything else, the school of grace is, amen, exceedingly worthwhile to enter into it, amen, that it may teach you how to say no, and when you say it, you mean it. Many children are going to go back to school. They learn, need to learn how to say no to many things that will come their way. Since Satan is the prince of this world, why should Christians crave its fashions, its fads, and its fantasies? The grace of God calls for a complete break with the cravings of the flesh. According to 2 Corinthians 6, 12, Come out from among them, and be ye separate, saith the Lord, and touch not the unclean thing. In this verse, it calls and heeds a command to be obeyed. The command is to live a separate and dedicated life. It comes from God and should be obeyed by every one of us. We must lay aside and or deny worldly lusts that's presented constantly by Satan. Watching TV, you're bombarded with lust. Driving down the street, look at amen, you're bombarded with lust. You're going to buy chewing gum, amen. You can't get past the counter without being bombarded with some type of lust. But then uh, it teaches us that we ought to be doing certain things. Th certain things we ought not to do, but there are certain things we ought to be doing. Having already schooled us, in denying certain things, God's grace now instructs us to do certain things. With regarding to ourselves, we are to live soberly. Live soberly. God's grace teaches us that we are to be governed by the Holy Spirit. Each Christian is expected to what? Exercise self-control in their eating, in their drinking, in their thinking, in their acting, in their speaking. In all of our pursuits, we should endeavor to control our desires and to do our best to resist the temptation of Satan. That's in regards to self, but what about in regards to others? We should live righteously, righteously. As living soberly has to do with righteous on the inside, living righteously has reference to righteousness in relationship to other people. One must be correct in their character before they can be correct in their conduct. Living righteously is simply the outliving of the indwelling Christ. We should be just in our dealings, charitable in our judgment, blameless in our conduct, and active for the spiritual welfare of other people. 
We ought to be living righteously. But then in regards to God, regards to self, regards to others, but now in regards to God, we should live godly. Godliness has an internal as well as an external phase. The internal phase consists of right knowledge, a complete trust in him, a cheerful surrendering of our will to him, a fervent love for him, a genuine longing for the fulfillment of him. Then the external phase consists of an adoration and a worship of God and faithful service to him. Godliness is the nature of God implanted in our regeneration and outward working in our daily conduct. Whatever we do, whatever we do, whatever we do should be done to the glory of Almighty God. The school of God's grace teaches us to live soberly, righteously, and godly here and now. Amidst the troublesome disorder and rebellion, instinct, insubordinate appetites, and uncontrolled cravings. When we read the first chapter of Titus, we begin to understand why Paul had to re-encourage this young pastor and this young church to get back to the school of God's grace. He needs to remind the believers to return to the school of God's grace because of their lives that they were presently living and how they have forgotten their past and lost hope in the future. The world they lived in, just like ours, pokes fun at all of us trying to live a godly, righteous, and holy life. Even in the religious community, it is deemed not important and somewhat legalistic to live the life that we're trying to live. Therefore, the Apostle Paul continues to teach them in the school of grace and instructing them on what they should be, what, looking forward to certain things. Looking forward to certain things. The question is, why do we live godly, righteous, holy lives? We live that way because we are looking for the coming of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. We live the way we live because he is coming for a church that is ready and waiting for his return. We live the way we live because he is coming for a church that is without spot or blemish. A people that have their robes washed in the blood of the Lamb. We live the way we do because we want to be ready when he returns. I don't know about you, but I look forward to his coming back. I look forward to that blessed hope, that glorious appearance. When that eastern sky breaks and there he is in all of his glory and all of his splendor. Oh, what a day that's going to be. My question to you is, what are you looking forward to? As you live life here and now, what are you looking forward to? Jesus is coming soon. But by and large, the world is not looking for the coming of the Lord. Many people in the church today come to church, call themselves Christians, but are not looking for the coming of the Lord. That is not their heart. Focus is looking for the coming of the Lord. No, more and more in the days that people are looking for new age thinking and new age philosophies and how I can entertain myself and what makes me feel good in this life and what's important to me. At least eight times in the New Testament is referred to the coming of the Lord as a thief in the night. Nobody knows when he's going to come. Mama used to talk about Jesus would come any day. Amen. Her father was a preacher, and he used to preach that Jesus can come any day. And you can go back generation after generation before and before. Jesus can come any day. But the Bible is clear. No man knows the day or the hour when our Lord may come back. You and I may not even make it out of this service today. Some of you would be so disappointed that Jesus came back before you got to your favorite restaurant. Lord, couldn't you have waited? So we must live soberly, righteously, and godly in this present life. We must live with the rapture in mind. We must live like we are looking for the coming any day now. What certain things are you looking for? The school of God's grace educates us that we also should be realizing certain things. Now, what I want everybody to understand in this message is this. How you view your past. And how you look forward to your future has a great deal with how you live your life in the present. How you view your past 
How you look forward to your future has a great deal with how you do in living in the present. Right now, all of us that are breathing are suspended between the tensions of our past and our future, which is called our presence. How we act, how we speak, how we live, how we dress, how we think, how we treat other people, whether I serve the Lord or the devil, these certain things are largely determined by the tension between my past and the pressure of my future. My past and my future determines the kind of man I am today. Now, I'm no Dr. Phil, and I don't have a degree in psychology, but I can tell you a little bit about a person, amen, amen, about looking at their past. And I can tell you a whole lot about a person by their perspective on their future, just by observing them right now. Amen. We all are in right now. We all live in the presence, the here and now. The present is powerful. The devil is frightened with the present. There's nothing he can do with his future because his future has already been sealed. But he can still do some damage in the present. That is why the devil is always wanting you to look at your past or look at your future and get your eyes off of right now. If the church could ever catch this and begin to just pray right now, start giving to God right now, start fasting right now, Start loving Bible study right now. Get busy winning souls right now. Begin to praise God the way he deserves to be praised right now. There's no telling what kind of revival could take place right now in the house of God. There's no telling what God would do through an individual like that. But the devil wants you to say, not right now, tomorrow. Not right now, next week. Not right now. Wait a minute. Wait for next year. He is afraid of right now. He is afraid of the person who was saying, I need to get things right with God today. I need to handle my business with God today. Because how I live today will determine my future. And how I'm living now, apart from Christ, is because of my past. We need to commit our presence to the God. We need to commit our right nows to God. Whatever you want me to do, wherever you want me to go, that's what I want to do. The University of God's Grace also schools us on what we should be holding on to certain things. Holding on to certain things. The way I understand my past is that my past 61 years of my life are gone. They're gone. I can't do anything ever to retrieve those 61 years. As much as I may want to, I can't go back and get them. I wish I told somebody else, I wish I could be 50 again. I can't go back there. I can try to act like I'm 50, but I'm, I it can't be 50. Some of us want to be 20 again. Amen. But you can't get back there. Those years are gone. The decisions that I've made over this past 160, these 61 years have been my decisions. I hope they were right ones because I can't go back and undo them. I wish I could. There are many I would go back and I would change. I would change a whole bunch of things in my life if I had a do-over, if I had a mulligan. But I can't do it over again. The Bible tells me it's my past. And I'm living in my present. And I'm strung in the tension between my past and my future. The way I view my past establishes how I live today. And the understanding of the future determines whether I live in hope or whether I live in despair. Uh -huh. My actions today are determined by those 61 years of my past and how I view my future. So I would think that all of us need to have a clear understanding of what God has done in our past yes. and what God has promised in our future. Yes. Amen. If that's what's having an effect on our present living. Right. I'm so glad that in my past when I was lost, past. that I didn't have to stay lost. I'm so glad when I was messed up and didn't know it right from wrong in a lot of ways. I, I'm so glad I didn't have to stay that way. I'm so glad that God's grace yes, from last week came down where I was and rescued me. Yes, yes. And according to Acts chapter 2, I've been born again. 
I've repented of my sins. I've been baptized in the name of Jesus. I've been filled with the Holy Ghost. And I don't, I just didn't shake the preacher's hand. I just didn't put my name on the church roll. No, no, no. I just, amen. I, I, I just didn't recite a prayer. But there's been a new birth experience on the inside of me. There's been a change that's come over me. I'm not saved because I think somebody else told me I was saved. I'm saved because I experienced Christ come into my life, save me from my sins, wash my sins out of my life. I feel clean. I feel brand new. I feel filled with the anointing of the Holy Ghost of God. I know without a doubt I've been saved. I've been born again. I have no doubt my past has been forgiven. I know I'm a child of Almighty God. I know I've got a future in God in heaven. I know it for myself by his grace because I had an experience. I had an experience with God. I was born again of the water and of the spirit. And it has been a relationship with Jesus Christ ever since. Every day with Jesus is sweeter than the day before. Coach says every day is a good day and some days are. Yeah. Amen. I want you to know today that it doesn't matter what you have done in your past. Thank you, Jesus. Now understand me when I say that. It doesn't matter if you want to move forward with God. It does matter if you don't want God. But God is saying to you with his grace that if you're willing to confess Jesus Christ as your Lord, it doesn't matter. He says the past will be washed away, forgotten about. But pastor, you don't know what I've done. Washed away. But brother preacher, no, 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 no. I, I, I had abortions. I, I, I committed murder. I, I was drugs. I was a prostitute. I was a pimp. I was a drug dealer. Washed away. I was a good, decent, moral person doing good things, helping other people. Washed away. Washed away. In the blood of Jesus Christ. When you're born again, it doesn't matter what you've done in your past. If you're born again, your past has been eradicated. God says it won't be rise up against you no more. Just like you saw the little demons of damnation coming around the people. Jesus came and went like that. And amen. They fell down and they rolled back. Amen. But they didn't stay back. They got back up again. So that's when you got to keep coming back to the school of grace. Not to get saved again, but to understand that you are saved by the blood of God. Amen. Your sins have been forgiven. The beauty of that, he says, as far as the east is from the west. He didn't say the north or the south. You heard me say this before. If it's north or south, you go so far north. Get to the north pole and you come back around. What? And you'll meet your sins again. Right. But as far as the east is from the west, as long as you're traveling east, you'll always be going east. No matter where you are. You'll never meet west as long as you're going east. It's not until you stop and look back the other way that you'll find west. God is so wise. He didn't say from the north, from the south, but from the east, from the west. That tells me that my past, all those things I'm ashamed about. Boy, if you put them up there on the big screen right now, I go like, excuse me, I got to get out of here. Amen. But I'm so glad. I'm so glad when you want to turn on your big screen and see my past, all you get is a black screen. It's, why? it's been washed out by the blood of Jesus Christ. I don't know about you, but I've been some places I shouldn't have been. I've done some things I shouldn't have done. But I'm so glad that I've been born again. Wash in the blood. As long as it's under the blood, I've been forgiven. I've been forgiven. I've been forgiven. Not just pushed out of the way and, and, and God's got it in the back of his mind and he wrote it down over here just in case. No, no, you're doing good right now, but just in case you slip. No, forgiven. 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 If God has forgiven me, I ought to forgive myself. I don't need to drink and do drugs because, amen, amen, we're trying to drown all of my past. It keeps messing up my future and my present. No, 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 no. I've been forgiven by God Almighty 
through his son, Jesus Christ. I am a child of the most high God. Amen. Amen. You go back to your school reunions and they talk and amen, they, they remind you of your nicknames and what you used to do, but that's the past. That's not me anymore. Oh, yes, it is. No, it's not. That's not me anymore. I've been changed. As I've said before, we're all living in the past, in between the past and the future, which is the present. We're all here in the present living right now. Yes. Let me be honest with you. In the present life, there is pain. Yes. There is sickness. Yes. And there is suffering. I'm just being real with you. I'm a child of Almighty God. Right. The God that created the heavens and the earth. The God that sent his only son. But even in this life, in this present life, there is pain yes, I must deal with. Yes, sir. There is sickness. Yes. And there is suffering. In the present, there are disappointments and there are perplexing situations. There are troublesome times. And there are certain things we must go through in order to get to the other side. That's right. Somebody said, life is a journey. Yes, it is. Amen. Amen. Sometimes there's some hills you got to climb. Right. Sometimes you got to go through the valley. Right. But through it all, you're going to get to the other side right. if your right. presence is right with God. In the present, there are fiery furnaces we must contend with. In the present, there are lion's den that we have to deal with. In the present, there are Red Sea dilemmas that we've got to deal with. There are those of you here today, if you just told the truth about it, I mean really told the truth about it, this past year or so has perhaps been the most trying year of your life. You've been through unbelievable trials. You've had to go through financial difficulties. You had to suffer sickness. You yeah. had to deal with the losing of a precious loved one. On You've had problems that knocked the breath out of you. Yes, sir. Then they seemed to, amen, come one right after the other. Yes. And just when you thought you were getting a break, come on. just when you thought you're getting your feet back under, you're getting your balance back, yeah. just as soon as you come, just like bowling pins, here come another big bowling ball looking to knock you over. Come on now. You've encountered problems in your marriage, problems with your family. The cloud gathered over your head. The wind began to blow. The storm began to rage. The rain started to fall. And it seems like you were all alone. No one understood your plight. They said, we're praying for you. But nobody really understood what you were going through. The trial seems to be an unending day. All day long, you wake up with it. You go to sleep with it. You wake up with it. It's like it never ends. And it's only because you were holding on to certain things. That's what kept you. It was the reality that you had built your life upon the rock of God's holy word. You, re you remain zealous for the work of the Lord. I want you to know today that, that this life, this present life, is just for a little while. And it will soon all be over. You will have your heartache and you will have your pain and you're going to have your suffering. But it's only for a little while. And it's going to all be over. You did hear in the passage, the scripture says, and it came to pass. Whatever you're going through today, it has come to be around here for a little while. But it has also come to pass. Finally, let me close this thing out. The school bell has already rung. If you compare the billions and the billions of years in eternity with this present life that we live, that we're so messed up about. It's just a puff of smoke, and it's all gone. It's just a puff of smoke, and it's all gone. I can remember when I was in high school, hey amen, the teacher, 35 and 40 years old, was old. Sure enough old. Them old folks don't know nothing about what you're trying to tell us young folks. But when I got 40, 40 didn't look so old at all. 50 looked pretty good to me when I was 40. But I had to keep on living. And when I got 50, 60 looked pretty good. But now that I'm tiptoeing over 60, amen, 70 looked pretty good. I'm looking at people 70, how old are you? How old are you? you look pretty good for 70. I think I can get there. Amen. I was telling the deacons yesterday, I got this little app on my phone called My Fitness Pal. Amen. I'm looking at my nutrients. I get my exercise. I'm plugging it in. Amen. Why? Well, I want to get to 70. Amen. Amen. And when I get to 70, I know I'm going to be looking, who 80 in here? Amen. Amen. When you compare this little short life 
is nothing compared to eternity. This life is just the entrance into the life to come. Now, you do know there's a life beyond uh, this life. We are, amen. We're not laying up treasures for this life. We're not just putting up four money and 401k and 401bs and retirement plans. No, 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 no. All that stuff is going to be messed up, tore up, and spent. Amen. But listen, something you need to understand about life, there is, as I said earlier, there are disappointments. There are pains and there's problems. There's sickness and sorrows and tears. But on that day, on that day, what a day that's going to be. I'm looking forward to that day. Paul tells Titus to remind the people that I'm looking forward to the blessed hope. The glorious appearing of the great God and our Savior, Jesus Christ. If you know that your future, amen, if you know what about your future is presently, amen, really, it doesn't mean that much. When you really know your future, when you really know where you're going, when you really know what you're going to be about, what I'm going through right now and all the little problems just don't seem like that much. What kept the early church going in the midst of persecution was that they were looking for his coming at any time. They woke up every morning with the thought on their mind, he may come today. The apostle Paul and all the apostles with him, amen, were martyred except for John. But that didn't stop them. That didn't stop them from proclaiming the truth of God's holy word. Why? Because they thought he just might come today. Peter, why are you preaching? Amen. Don't you know they're going to throw you in jail? That's all right. He just might come today. Paul and Silas, they're going to beat you and put you in prison. That's all right. He just might come today. Why are you going down the Lystra, Paul? Listen, they're going to stone you. The stones down there are big. That's all right. He just might come today. The world, listen, the world will say to you, just denounce the name of Jesus Christ. When we won't feed you to the lions. I can't do that. Why? Because he just might come today. I ask you, what are you looking for? Is your past under the blood? Is your future secure? Are you living with the rapture in the forefront of your mind? Why? Because he just might come today. We are not living down here for, amen, this little two-bit world. But he have what? In, we have an inheritance waiting for us up in heaven. That's why you and I can see many church members today go through unbelievable problems and we wonder how they can keep on praising God after we see them going through all the things they're going through. Anybody else would have lost their mind. Anybody else would have given up on the church, given up on Jesus Christ. But why do they keep praising God, being on fire for God? Amen. Their treasure is not in this life. Everything they're looking for is not in this life. When you find yourself going through something, you need to remind yourself of certain things like the best is yet to come. When you're facing your difficulties and your disappointments and your pain and your sickness and your sorrows and your trials, remind yourself that the best is yet to come. Listen, my brother, I know you've been laid off your job, but God's going to give you a better job. But if he doesn't, remember this one thing, the best is yet to come. My sister, you're facing staggering problems this year. I believe God is going to bring you through. But even if it, the problems don't end, hold on because the best is yet to come. Listen, Dad, I know you're battling with heart troubles. Amen. And you, and you want God to heal you. And he may heal you and he may not heal you in this life. But hold on because the best is yet to come. Mother, I know you would love for your daughter to move back in your house. But if it doesn't happen, the best for her life is yet to come. Grandma, you're facing moving into an elderly home. And you're I mean, not sure how all that's going to work out. But I want you to know something. The best is yet to come. Listen, soldier, I know it's not easy to leave your family behind, knowing that you may not ever see them again when you hit that battlefield. You may leave in a couple of weeks, and you may never see them in this life again. But I want you to know the best is yet to come. For we'll meet you in that city whose builder and maker is God. Because the best is yet to come. I wish I had a church that would say that with me. The best is yet to come. 
The Bible says, I have not seen, ear have not heard, neither had entered in the heart of man the good things, the certain things which God has prepared for those that love them. Hold on, Christian soldier. Hold on to God's unchanging hand. Hold on. I know you're tired. Hold on. The race gets hard, but it's all right because the best is yet to come. God bless you. I'm through. Amen. The best is yet to come. Amen. What a mighty God we serve. The best is yet to come.